Welcome to the J. Kim Show. This is your host, J. Kim. I am an investor, author, and fitness entrepreneur. And for the first time in Asia, I sit down with the world's most brilliant minds in business, investing, and entrepreneurship. You'll learn all the secrets, strategies, and formulas to becoming a successful entrepreneur directly from the masters. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insight to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. Hey, ladies and gents, I'm very excited today to announce the launch of my book, Hack Your Fitness. I wrote this book specifically for busy professionals and entrepreneurs, very much like yourselves, that don't have a lot of time to spend every week in the gym on their fitness. So in the book, I give you everything you need to know from psychology to nutrition to the actual workouts that you need to do at the bare bones minimum to get your fitness under control in under three hours a week. So head on over to Amazon and check it out. I'm running a special promotion this week, and the book is discounted to just $2.99. So pick up a copy and let me know what you think. Now, in conjunction with my book launch, I have an exciting guest on the show today, and it's my friend Tucker Max, who is actually the person who helped me write my book. Tucker is the co-founder and CEO of Book in a Box, which is a company that turns book writing and publishing into a service. So Tucker himself is a very seasoned author. He's written three number one New York Times bestsellers, which have collectively sold over three million copies worldwide. He's credited with being the originator of the literary genre frat hire and is the only the third writer after Malcolm Gladwell and Michael Lewis to ever have three books on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list at the same time. So in this episode, Tucker goes into all the details about why entrepreneurs should write books and some of the interesting facts behind the publishing industry that most people probably don't know, and how you can turn an idea into the book through his company, which is exactly the process that I did, and how easy it was for me to write my book in less than a year. So for all you entrepreneurs and small business owners out there, please tune into this episode because writing a book is a great way to add to your core business. So let's get right into the show. Tucker is a very funny and dynamic guy. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. And uh, let's get right to it and go uh, pick up a copy of Hack Your Fitness at uh, Amazon. Thanks. Tucker, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're excited to have you here today. And uh, it's particularly exciting because I'm launching my book this week. So I think it's very special that the person that actually helped me write my book is on the show. Uh, So for our audience out here in Asia uh, and listening around the world, why don't you just give us a quick introduction uh, of who you are and what you do? So uh, my name is Tucker Max. I co-founded the company Book in a Box that, that you use to write your book. I mean, I like I wrote three number one bestsellers. You know, I've had a movie made about my life, but that's kind of like a different part of my life. Right now, I'm mainly focused on Book in a Box. Right. So for the audience that's listening, you guys can just Google search Tucker Max and you can read all about his other uh, stuff in his past. But he is doing exciting things now at Book in a Box, which is uh, what I'm, uh, you know, it's affected me the most because it's actually helped me write my book. So why don't we jump straight into talking a little bit about Book in a Box. Exactly how did you uh, come up with this idea? I mean, you obviously have a background in in writing. You are a very successful author and you had some background in publishing as well. Is that right? Yeah, right. So, uh, I, I mean, not background really. I just, uh, I wrote my first book in 06 and and. And I was writing on the internet, like I was one of the very first people to kind of write good quality stuff and put it up for free on the internet in like 2001, like back before MySpace even existed. Mm -hmm. And so like I've been doing this for, yeah, I'm coming up on 20 years now. And then, uh, so basically the the whole thing started, like I wish I could, you know, everyone has this image that entrepreneurs are like these successful entrepreneurs have these flashes of genius and, and insight and they you know come down from the mountain with their their amazing companies already done and that's just not what happens and I think my story is actually a really good example of that it, like I almost it's kind of funny uh, I almost had to be 
um, beaten into doing a successful company. And so like, I'll tell you the story. I was at, I was at this entrepreneur dinner and this woman comes up to me and at this point, you know, I'd already written three number one bestsellers. I'd sold millions of books. I was well known as an author, Hmm. but I didn't have a publishing company really or anything, uh, at least nothing substantive. And so she, she said, you know, like, Hey, listen, I, people have been asking me to write a book for a decade. Uh, I don't have the time or desire to sit down at a computer and type this thing out. But, but my book would help people, and, and they want it. How can I get this thing out of my head without having to go through the normal process? Mm-hmm. And so I kind of looked at her, and I said, hold on. So you're asking me, how can you write a book without writing it? Right. And she said, yeah, actually, I, like I kind of am. And so then, of course, I, I started making fun of her, and I started lecturing her, like, you know, like, everyone wants to be a star, no one wants to do the work, and, and, and ta- telling her, like, oh, the writing is part of the process, and blah, blah, blah. And so after about three to five minutes of me being a really condescending prick to her, she kind of rolled her <laughs> eyes, and she said, Tucker, are you an, this is an entrepreneur dinner. Are you an entrepreneur? And I was like, well, yeah, of course. And she's like, yeah, I'm not so sure that's true. She said, an entrepreneur would help me solve my problem, not lecture me about hard work. I was like... (laughs) (laughs) Called you out. (laughs) Yeah, right. She totally called me out. But the thing is, she was 100% right, man. I mean, this woman had this super successful company. She had a family. She she was doing 10 times more than I was. And I was lecturing her about hard work instead of helping her solve her issue. So, uh, of course, I became obsessed with this idea. How do I get her book out of her head without her Mm -hmm. having to sit at a computer and type it? And I, I couldn't, like, it took me like a month or something. And then it all came at once. It was like, oh, God, this is so obvious. Like, Socrates, how many, think about how many people never wrote a word down but have really famous books. Socrates, Jesus, Buddha, Malcolm X, Marco Polo, all these people used scribes mm-hmm. to write their books, right? And so it was like, oh, of course. Why can't I just be her scribe? Uh, and so, like, I got on the phone with her and I said, all right, here's the thing. I'm not going to learn anything. She didn't want a ghostwriter, right? She didn't want me to research her subject and write my book about it. And I didn't want to learn about her subject. So it had to be her words and her voice, like a true scribe. You know, like no one thinks Jesus had a ghostwriter or Socrates (laughs) had a ghostwriter. This is what they said and thought. And so so she wanted the same thing. She wanted her voice in her book. So I said, all right, look, I'll do everything. I, I wrote down on a whiteboard every single thing you have to do to write a book. And I realized the only parts I needed her for were, were for the actual knowledge. Like I could do mm-hmm. everything else. Right. And so uh, I, I just, I would get on the, me and Zach uh, Oberon, who's my co-founder, mm-hmm. we basically got on the phone with her when we needed her, got everything out of her head, and then we did the work on the back end. And, and you know, we kind of structured and, and outlined her book by interviewing her. Then we kind of got all the content out of her head by interviewing her. We, we transcribed uh, all the, the sort of interviews we kind of cleaned up the prose. Uh, she gave us notes on it. And then all of a sudden, we had this really good book. And, uh, and, and here's what's so funny, Jay. I was so dumb. Like, I didn't even think this was a business. I was like, okay, like, you know, this is in, an interesting project. She paid me money. It was kind of fun. Right. And I was done. And then she started referring people to us. And then I told some of my friends about this and they actually cut checks to me. Like it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen, man. It was like, I was like, oh, listen to this cool thing I did. And they were like, oh, you can do that? Here's a check. Let's start. Right. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't understand. Like, that's how dumb I was. Like, uh, people were throwing money at me. Yeah, but the thing is, at that point, you hadn't, you probably hadn't thought about how can we scale this because I, I imagine, you know, your clients won. It, you must have put in quite a significant amount of work. You must have created a great book, and you probably didn't streamline it just yet. So maybe at that point, you probably would have been like, I don't know if I could do, you know, a hundred of these, no, no, these no, no, a year. No. Right? You're being too kind to me, Jay. Like it wasn't <laughs> even about. I wasn't sure if I could scale it. I was so dumb, like like dumb, like I blind is the right word. I was so blind, it just didn't even occur to me that this was a business. Because right. in my mind, this is not how writers write books, right? Because right? that's not the way I had ever done it. So I just I like I had a, a blindness in me. And then I went on Lewis Howes' podcast mm-hmm. to talk about something totally different. And Lewis is very dyslexic, but mm-hmm. he had just finished his book and he had a conventional ghostwriter. Use my buddy Niels Parker. 
Mm-hmm. And we were talking about that process, and I was like, oh, Lewis, I wish, you know, like, you had called me, we talked about this earlier, and I told him about this kind of new thing I was doing with this woman, and I wasn't, like, pitching this as a company, but Lewis is like, that's the best idea I've ever heard, what do you call it? <laughs> and Zach, the day before, had joked with me, like, that we're doing a book in a box with her, and so, like, I said, uh, <laughs> we call it book in a box, like, we didn't even have the name at that point, and, and Lewis is like, oh, it's such a great idea, all my fans, go check this out. And, and I didn't really think more. We continue with the podcast. The next day, I got an email about Book in a Box, and it, which made no sense because I knew the podcast wasn't out. And right. I'm like, dude, who are you? Like, like, how did you know about this? And the guy was like, oh, sorry, man. I'm Lewis's podcast producer. I was just wondering where I could find, you know, like Book in a Box and, 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 and look at it and maybe sign up. And I was like, Zach, dude, this may be a company. And Zach's yeah. like, you know, Zach's smarter than I am. Zach's like, of course it's a company, you idiot. Why do you think we are doing? So then we put up a landing page and then we did like $200,000 worth of business in the first two months. And I was like, that's Jay. That's when I started thinking about scaling and started mm. thinking, oh man, how do we get, and then we started hiring freelancers. And then, you know, now two and a half years later, we've done 450 books and yours is about wow. to come out. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a step back, Tucker, because you have a lot of experience in the traditional publishing world as well. So why don't you just uh, quickly, I know there's a lot to it, but if you could quickly summarize the differences, uh, maybe just quickly run us through how a traditional publishing uh, model works and how that differs from now the other end of the extreme, which is self-publishing, where right. any Joe Schmo can just type up an ebook and publish it on Amazon. And then how you guys are sort of in the middle somewhere, right? Right. So, so there's, it, you're exactly right. There's a, like a long, it's a very deep, complicated, weird subject, books are. And if you go to bookinabox.com, we have a blog. And there's a piece that, that, that runs you through all of the, the in deep detail, what are the three ways to publish? There's three basic ways. There is traditional publishing, there's professional publishing, and there's self-publishing, right? So traditional is like uh, what most people think of when they think of books. They think of like Random House or Simon & Schuster or the big companies, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, professional is sort of those companies in between like us, uh, like Book in a Box. And there's a bunch of other companies of varying degrees of quality that basically assist you with your publishing. And then mm-hmm. self is essentially when you just do it all yourself, right? And, and I'm, I'm kind of glossing over categories, but those are the three basic breakdowns. And there's really only two things you need to think about, two things that differ. Who owns your book and who does the work right. of creating the book, right? So in traditional publishing, they completely own your book. When, you know, they give you an advance, Usually, not always, but usually, and then they own the rights. So you can't give it away free. You can't excerpt it and use it on your blog. You get none of that stuff without their permission. They own it, right? right. And then, um, in most cases, they do the work of publishing it. They don't. They used to do work in marketing. They don't anymore. So, really, what's happening is you're essentially giving them ownership in exchange for a little bit of upfront money. And then the status and prestige that you perceive that they have, but most people just don't care about it anymore. Like that was definitely true 20, 30 years ago, that they had a lot of status and prestige, but now it kind of just isn't true anymore. Then the middle option, which is professional publishing, you own, all, it, it kind of varies, but like with us, like your book, you own it fully. So if you want to give it away free, you want to charge $100 for it, anything you want, you can do. Uh, and then we do all the work publishing, uh, not just we help you write it and we help you publish it. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, all you're doing is paying us for a service, right? Now, there are other companies that will take some ownership and will do less of the work, or it kind of varies. You have to be very specific with the company, like Ben Bella is an example, or there's plenty of other companies that, that, that for varying, that, that either they will take a little bit of ownership or, and they'll do some of the work or, or not, not, you know, they'll do some, some degree. We're kind of at the extreme. We do all of the work and we give you all of the ownership and you pay us. Right. So what, with the traditional publishing, when you let's talk economics real quick. So when you say that they own almost everything, literally, what percentage of royalty does the author actually get? Well, so, so even more important than royalty, they own the rights. So, so okay. like you cannot, th- this cannot be printed or reproduced in any form without their explicit permission. Right. Wow. So that, that the royalties uh, in America, the royalties are very common. It's uh, the author gets 15% of hardcover, 
seven and a half percent of paperback. And does the advance, that's a, a separate from the advance or the advance gets... That's separate from the advance, but the, okay. the advance is, is like basically they give you money. It, it, you can think of it like an interest-free loan that you don't ever have to pay back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then any sales are credited against the advance until you, you outsell it. So for example, if you get a $100,000 advance, then until you're not going to get any money from book sales until your royalties are in excess of $100,000. You're 15%, you mean? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. So you, <laughs> okay. So that, so you have to sell like a quarter, a lot of three quarters of a million of, yeah, bucks yeah. to get. Right. You've got to sell tens, of tens of thousands of copies, if not hundreds of thousands. Yes. Right. Wow. Okay. So it's pretty, pretty bad economics for the author. You, you it's definitely are. Bad. Yeah. Okay. So, and then with the book in a box, it's, it's basically, it's a fee that you pay to book in a box and you own everything and you keep whatever less the, I guess the printing and Amazon costs that are associated. You keep all the profit. Yeah, of course you keep all the profit. Right. And, and and so here's something a lot of people don't, don't even consider it's when you own the rights. So with us, you have the final creative say, so like in your book, you, you know, we're going to tell you what we think the cover should be or we think good, you know, good, a good look is, but you get to decide what the cover is, what's in the book, what the name of the book is. You made, you made the final decision on all of those, Jay. If you were with a traditional publisher, you don't make the final decision. They make the final decision because they own the rights. So if they wanted to call your book, Jay Kim stinks, they could. You know, like they, they they wouldn't because that would be stupid, but like they, they could absolutely call it that and they could, they could make the cover something you hate. And I've seen it happen dozens, hundreds of times actually. Right. And so as, as someone that has been, has gone through that side of things, is there, here's a question for you, Tucker, is there a sort of a hierarchy, so to speak, within even traditional, traditional publishing where people who... Uh, people look down on people that use ghostwriters versus, uh, I mean, is there, there must be some sort of unspoken hierarchy, right? Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends. So writer, people who are professional writers, like, like I used to be, Mm -hmm. it's like every group of people thinks that their, their group is the best, you know? I mean, like the story I told at the beginning of the show about, about how I looked down on Melissa because she was asking me how to figure out, figure this process out that that's, it's embarrassing for me to admit it, but that's like that's the normal attitude for writers, and most writers aren't embarrassed by that. They think if you if your fingers are not the ones touching the keyboard, that like you are somehow invalid, right? But right. then when you think about that, it doesn't make any sense. The greatest thinkers in Western history did not write down the words. What they what they did is they came up with the ideas. That's what matters. Who came right. up with the ideas? And how well did you articulate those ideas is what matters. And so, like, for example, um, I mean, like Martin Luther King's a great example. Mm-hmm. He didn't write any books. He was an amazing public speaker and had amazing ideas, right? And his ideas inspired a lot of people to write a lot of things. No one would ever say Martin Luther King is not one of the most influential, beautiful thinkers of this century, Right, just because he didn't write stuff down, that doesn't make any sense. Right, Sa- same with Socrates, same with Jesus, same with whatever. Mm-hmm. It- it's just that in- any group is going to 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 try and make th- what they do special to make themselves feel better. And, and I-, I just I- like I-, I ended up rejecting that. I thought it was total BS. You know, just like a lot of pub people in publishing will tell you, oh, if your book isn't published by us then it's not valid, basically, is what they'll say, which doesn't make any sense. If you look at the last 10 years, some of the most, the best-selling, most influential, most important books are self-published. I mean, right. James Altucher sold millions of self-published books. Mm-hmm. Hugh Howey, Amanda Hawking. My mm-hmm. God, Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey sold 5 million copies before E.L. James basically sold it to a publishing company. Right. Wow. And, and, and so, like, and like, I, I don't like that book. I think it's terrible. But a hundred million women disagree <laughs> with me. You know. So clearly, I'm wrong about that. Right. And, and the idea that that if you look at books and ideas as a social signaling mechanism, like that's, I think that's what's invalid. I think what you should be worrying about is what do you have to say, not 
who chose you. In fact, what I tell people now, it used to be that self-publishing was considered vanity press. Like if you mm. couldn't get selected by publishers, you had to go pay someone to get published. That was before right. the internet existed, right? That was like in the 80s and early 90s. Right. But once once uh, sort of like the early self-publishing companies like iUniverse and Lulu uh, kind of democratized the press, what you saw was all these amazing ideas start springing up out of uh, self-published work. And then you realized, oh, wow, like there's all these great voices that are not being picked. Uh, and, and so maybe it's the publishers that are wrong. And, mm. and now the real vanity press is actual traditional publishing. It's the people who think they have to be picked by Random House to be important right? because their ideas stink. So they need a publisher. They need the name of a publisher on their spine to make them look valid. Wow, that's quite interesting. It, it, eh, very interesting that it's flipped that way. So it sounds like there's no reason whatsoever to actually want to go traditional publishing unless it's just something like a vanity metric personally or something that you want to brag about to your friends to say. So let's talk about, and then obviously economics wise, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to go that direction either. So now let's talk about... How do you make a mon- how do you make money writing a book? Because I think a lot of people have the wrong have a misconception about this as well. Yeah. So uh, the, the narrative that most people think in, in terms of making money from a book is, oh, well, I have to sell a lot of copies, right? And and mm-hmm. so uh, people, we we I know you know this, Jay, but but I hope your listeners can learn if they don't know mm-hmm. this. We live in the twenty first century now. If, so, if, a, if you can make a copy of something for free, then it is not going to be where you make money. Like, uh, that's just, that is a fact, that is an axiom of the digital economy is that copies are free, right? Mm-hmm. So try, and I, like, if you've got a book out there and you're selling a few thousand copies a year or whatever, great, good for you, you know, milk that cow while it's still alive, but that cow is dying. And the way you make money from books now, the smart way, is to use the book as a, basically a multi-purpose marketing tool to market something else. So, for example, you can use the book to get you speaking gigs, which tend to pay a lot for, for, some, for some people. Or consulting gigs, right? Or coaching gigs. Or it can drive leads to your business. Or it can, I mean, there's a hundred things it can do that can help you establish authority credibility, like it can share your ideas to bring people to you for some reason or another that you can then generate revenue off of. Basically, look at at a book as one of the best marketing tools possible, then use it to figure out how to use it to make money. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And I think it makes sense if you have, if it's just a, like you said, a, a marketing tool or a business card, you, you like to say it's it's the new business card, right? Of It's like an ancillary marketing tool of your core business that'll drive revenue to your core business uh, or, or, yeah, get you speaking gigs or, or other open other doors for you. It certainly builds credibility when you have, uh, you know, a, a book, whether it's, you know, it, it's, it could be something very in a very niche uh, segments that maybe only you and a handful of others know about. Actually, but... the more niche, the better, Jay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. So let me. I'll explain why. So, so uh, here's the thing: if you want to be a famous self-help guru, I mean, good luck because you're competing <laughs> against. Now you're competing against Tony Robbins and Dale Carnegie and Tim yep. Ferriss. You're competing against the titans now, right? Right. right. But if you want to be the self-help guru to pregnant women living in Hong Kong, right? Mm -hmm. You got no competition. Right. And there's probably a lot of pregnant, I'm assuming, I don't know, but there's probably a lot of pregnant women in Hong Kong. But if you're going to be the the woman who teaches pregnant women, like you take all the stuff that, that, that pregnant women should be doing. And then you, you make it specific to Hong Kong. Like these are the five doctors you need to see. These are the three places to avoid. These are the five midwives I would recommend. These are, you know, whatever. right? Right. Then now every pregnant woman in Hong Kong, instead of going to some international uh, person, you know, Tony Robbins or some woman who's famous for helping pregnant women all around the world, like, you know, whoever, Dr. Spock or whatever, you go to this woman because she speaks to you specifically. She, she helps you. She knows you who you are, right? So right. many of our authors, what we do is we recommend 
that they they try and position their book wide because they want to impact the most number of people, but uh, they want to go wide and shallow. But what they end up doing is go narrow and deep. And then that ends up helping them substantially more than trying to hit everybody. Because if you, if you, no one, almost no one has something to say to everybody, but almost everyone has something important to say to a small number of people. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you hit the, the nail on the head there. So, okay. All right. So let's say Miss Female, Miss Hong Kong Tony Robbins is sold. She's like, okay, Tucker, I, I, I want to write a book. I want to reach my, my audience of uh, 200 Hong Kong pregnant women and I want to make an impact. So let's go. Let's sign up with Book in a Box. I want, let's walk through exactly what the steps are because I want the audience to actually know just how easy it, you know, the, the process was for me personally. So can you just walk us through how that works? Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, now, uh, just to let your viewers know, you guys can go to bookinabox.com slash book. And you can actually put in your email address and we'll send you a copy of our book for free, which mm. kind of details our entire process. But because uh, you can do it yourself. I mean, our, we charge 25 grand is sort of the base price now. Um, so it's expensive, but, um, but you, can do it, you can do this yourself just as easily. Uh, not just as easily, but you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Basically, we start by positioning your book first. So the fir what we do is, is we begin by asking you questions. Like, like there's three main questions to understand when you're starting a book. Why are you writing this book? Meaning, what result do you personally want to get? Like, mm -hmm. what's the thing, your ROI? The thing, not, not, not the, for the reader, for you. You've got to understand what you're looking for first. Right. Then you need to understand what audience do you have to reach to get that. Then you have to understand what you have to say that's relevant to that audience. So if you want to be the self-help person for Hong Kong pregnant women, right, then, then understand the first thing, what, why are you doing that? Because you want to, to coach and consult and sell products and, and, uh, and build a business around serving those people. That's your goal, right? So the audience are pre uh, women who are pregnant in Hong Kong. And uh, what you have to say is essentially, I'm just kind of spitballing here, you're repackaging all of the best pregnancy advice in a way that is specifically relevant to women living in a you know 10 mile radius or right. i guess less in hong kong's case right and so like like that the, now you understand now you have positioning for your book now you mm -hmm. know what your book is what you're trying to say who you're trying to reach and so we start there and then from there we kind of help you build a structure what exactly are you going to say and then we build an outline and we uh, you're not doing anything in this case, if you're a client of ours, except you're on the phone with us, we're interviewing you. We, we have a pretty specific way that we go about asking these questions. It's almost like an algorithm. For, for you as an author, all you do is just answer questions and talk about what you know. For us on the back end, like we, we, uh, you know, we, we use all your answers to kind of build out first the positioning, then the structure, then the outline. Mm -hmm. And so then what we end up with is about a 15 to 20 page outline. The details exactly what's it's a, exactly what's going to be in the book. It's the architecture for the book. Mm -hmm. So from that point, then you know you look at it, you approve it. You, you're like uh, then we move on. Then we, someone else, we bring a different person in, someone who's a very skilled interviewer, usually a journalist, and they interview you off of that outline, right? And and so they get everything out of your head, everything you have to say uh, about uh, all of the subjects in your book. Uh, that usually is about maybe five, six, seven calls, about an hour and a half to two hours a piece. Mm -hmm. We record all those calls. We then get that that recording transcribed, and then uh, that that same interviewer, you know, is also a writer. They essentially edit that transcription into book prose. It usually takes a couple rounds, but their job is to end up with a book that is completely your ideas, that is uh, all in your words and and in your voice. Right. right? So. Because we're not, like, we don't know shit about pregnant women in Hong Kong or about, like, how to sell tractors in Nebraska or right. about any of these things that we do books on. But what we do know is how to structure information, how to, how to create a book, and how to write. So uh, you come out of this with a book that is everything you're trying to say in your voice, but you didn't have to sit at the computer and type it all out. Right. So, so there's a percentage of people that might not have the expertise that's necessary. And that's another thing that you have to suss out during the initial round, right? Of yes, interviews. Yes. Yeah. So our process does not work if you don't know what you're talking about. We don't right. add content. That's the, really the essential thing that makes us different than ghostwriting is we're not adding content and we're not adding mm -hmm. ideas. These are your ideas and your content. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I, I went through the process. I, it was it was very quick, very streamlined. Uh, I think the outlining part was the hardest part, and I think that speaking with other authors that have gone sort of traditional that sort of route, that's the hardest part is is actually for setting up the framework for it, and then once this that structure is in place, the filling in the blanks is usually much quicker. Okay. And then so what happens after that? So then we do all the publishing. We kind of guide you through the process, although we do all the work. So, you know, we'll, we do the interior layout, like, you know, how, like the, the book, the book design. Then we do the book cover and, you know, you'll, we, we kind of, we have a whole process where we put you through, like, you know, you tell us the book covers you like, the designs you like, the ideas you have. We come back with three to five, uh, comparative covers you can look at. You know, you give notes. We go, go back and forth on that. We do all of this sort of marketing materials surrounding the book, you know, so your author bio, your picture, your, uh, you know, the book description, everything that you need to, so, so that your book looks and feels professional. We do all of that. Then we do all the distribution. We upload it on Amazon, iBooks. We, you know, make it available in Ingram, which is the big uh, book sort of database that all the bookstores order from, Barnes & Noble, et cetera, so that anyone can... Um, can order it and then uh then we do a little bit of marketing on the release and then it's it's good to go then it goes out into the world that's awesome i mean so personally the 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 thing that i liked about it as well is that during the editing process and sort of the 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 follow-up with the book covers and stuff like that as the author you can be as involved as you want to be and some i guess some authors are very hands off and they're kind of like okay i got the idea done i'm i'm out i have busy i'm busy i have other things to do other authors i i believe would want to get more involved and that was the case with with me my my experience is you know i i i really sat down with the editor and i went back and forth and they were great you know very patient with me making you know amendments after amendments and edits after edits and you know, we did we did uh, like three or four rounds of covers, and I was uh, I'm I'm pretty anal, so you might have heard from you guys that uh, I was a pain in the ass, but uh, in the end, it came out great. So I was very happy with the finished product, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm I'm excited for it to uh, to all come to fruition. So thank you for your help with that, Tucker. I, I appreciate. it. Of course, that. man. It's our pleasure. It's our job. So uh, thank you for being on the show. Last couple of questions, Tucker. Thank you for explaining the process and educating our audience. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy that, uh, that you got to come on and, and, and share this. What, what, does, what do you guys have in store for Book in a Box in 2017? What sort of goals do you have for your company? Man, um, right now our job is growing. Now is really we're in the scaling phase where it's like, oh, we've got so much work to do. Mm-hmm. We, could, we could be doing probably 100 books a month, but we don't, like the demand is out there at least for that, maybe even two or three or four times that. But we just don't have the structure for that yet. So we're kind of building a structure to, to be able to, to take on a lot more work. You know, and then not just maintain quality, but ideally we'd like a structure that actually improves as it gets bigger, which is hard to build, but doable. And then we're also going to start expanding into other sort of uh, fields because at this point we've worked with 450 plus uh, authors and a lot of them want more than books. Uh, mm-hmm. They want, you know, blog posts, they want video stuff, they want podcasts, they want all these other things. So we're going to start rolling out these other offerings, uh, kind of slow at first with a few people and then just build and build and build. Our goal is eventually to be the company that that anyone comes to to turn their ideas into finished media products, right? So like if, if you want to start a podcast or write a book or do whatever, you're going to have three options. You either do it yourself, you go try and find people to help you and hire them and manage them, which is a huge pain in the ass, or you just come pay us and we do all the work to turn your ideas into finished products. In a box. Yep. Awesome. Great. And uh, where is the best place uh, my audience can find you, connect with you, maybe learn a little bit more about Book in a Box and uh, get that that book that you said that, that you're giving away? Yeah, it's probably just bookinabox.com. Uh, bookinabox.com slash book should um, give the book away. And then the site, the site's pretty good, pretty comprehensive, um, has everything people should need on there. Yeah, great. All right. Well, thanks so much, Tucker. Really appreciate you coming on the uh, the show and uh, excited for the book launch. Definitely. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. 
All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.